So question 12, it says, air is almost completely made up of nitrogen and oxygen molecules. And in case, um, for those of you who might not have taken chemistry yet, these are uh, diatomic molecules. They have two uh, nitrogen molecules as two nitrogen atoms bound together and similar for oxygen. Uh, oh, yeah, both diatomic gases. And that will be an important fact. It says, answer the questions below. Now, let me go to the hint and uh, show you what the hint points to. Because um, there's a very specific thing that you should know. So when you click on hint, and it says, you know, review section 2.3, capacity and equipartition of energy. And um, when you look at specific heat, that's when you have to start to consider some of the properties of ideal gas that go beyond the saying that it's ideal gas. That there's a distinction between diatomic gas and monatomic gas. So when you go to the section and uh, you should read through that section more carefully, I'm just gonna scroll through quickly looking for the thing that I'm looking for. Now, if you are simply using this, you will get the wrong answer because this is the result that um, only holds for uh, monatomic uh, ideal gas. So let me just, this is where it talks about now degrees of freedom. When people measure specific heat of, heat specific heat of real gases, they find that simply using this expression, it does not lead to correct result. What they find is that there's this number that you have to consider called the degree of freedom. Um, with the monatomic gas, the degree of freedom is three. And it refers, it actually matches up to three spatial dimensions, X and Y and Z, a translational degree of freedom. For a diatomic gas, there is um, there are two, well, <laughs> there's technically four additional degrees of freedom of which uh, two are not frozen out. And if uh, you, you might remember from, if you took chemistry, either in high school or in college, you might remember this reference to degrees of freedom being frozen out. In fact, I think there's one of the conceptual questions that refer to that. And um, this plot is the thing that explains uh, better than what I can ramble right now. If you want, you can take this as a experimental fact that uh, if you have a diatomic gas, then at very cold temperatures, um, the rotational and vibrational degrees get frozen out. So you do have just the translational uh, kinetic energy to contend with. Now, as the, this diatomic gas heats up, the, the rotational degree will start to be unfrozen and that will come into play. And the whole freezing out business, it has to do with the quantum mechanics, which is why I don't want to get into it. Um, but it is, so this is the kind of the room temperature range. So for the purpose of this class, for a diatomic, uh, that is like um, molecules like nitrogen, N2, or oxygen, O2, and I guess CO2 gets more complicated, so we won't deal with that. But for diatomic gases, the degree of, degree of freedom is five, and where that comes from is um, kind of rotation about, um, so do I want to get into, don't have enough props here. If you have, um, if you imagine um, kind of a molecule uh, with the two atoms, then they can rotate about one axis, one axis that's uh, uh, kind of vertical here, or they can rotate about uh, kind of this axis. And there's one other axis where they can rotate it, but if they rotate this way, then it doesn't look all that different. So there are two axes around which that diatomic molecules can rotate. And that's where additional two degrees of freedom come from. Now with the diatomic molecules, there's actually uh, two more uh, degrees of, two more? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's two more degrees of freedom that has to do the vibration. And those come from the 
uh, vibration of kinetic energy and potential energy. And that's where this is seven half comes from at very high temperatures. We won't really ever consider those temperatures. So we'll just stay down here for five halves. <laughs> so, so that's what you have to know uh, for answering this question here, that you are dealing with uh, diatomic gas. So you have to know that the degree of freedom that you are considering, degree of freedom that you are considering is five. That's just something that comes from the fact that it's a, a, it's a, a diatomic gas. Now, I think a hint to get into this, uh, or I guess I have this note here. Um, so, you know, I don't, uh, in this class, I'm trying to avoid using moles and I've got the number. Um, so let me kind of show you how, um, how you can get from the equations that are in your textbook to the equation that you should be using uh, for the way I write the questions in this class. So equation in your textbook is telling you that this is the specific heat capacity per mole. Um, wait. Oh, molar heat capacity. So, um, so what that means is that this is the space. Uh, this is the heat capacity per mole of ideal gas when the process is under constant volume. <laughs> so. What your textbook is telling you is, um, so let me write down the textbook version, the specific capacity for a constant volume process per mole is degree of freedom over to R. And that which means if you're trying to write out what is the uh, flow of heat needed for certain amount of temperature change, then the expression would be this is specific capacity times the number of moles of gas times change of temperature. Let me uh, plug this in. Then you have the amount of heat needed for a particular temperature change is the degree of freedom over two times NR times the change of temperature delta T. And the version of the expression that doesn't rely on Avogadro's number, doesn't use moles, is one where you use this equi uh, equivalence between the number of moles times gas constant and number of molecules times Boltzmann constant. You kind of see, you saw, um, an aspect of this last week where I wrote down ideal gas law in two different forms. The form that I guess your textbook prefers is PV NRT, and that's also the version you saw in your chemistry class. But the version I will consistently use in this class is PV is equal to number of molecules, no moles, times Boltzmann constant times T. No, I've got the number, no, um, no gas constant, and and this is because I uh, I'm trying to minimize the number of arbitrary constants, and frankly, as it is, even Boltzmann constant is a bit of an arbitrary constant anyway. So, but I tolerate Boltzmann's constant. I won't tolerate gas constant. Um, so, so with that in mind, really. Um, what you can say is instead of having a, so this is the molar heat capacity, you can actually have heat capacity per molecule. And the heat capacity per molecule would be simply D over two times the Boltzmann constant. This is the heat capacity per molecule. And if you look at the question, I give you the actual number of molecules. So you can just multiply with that actual number of molecules. That's some number of moles that depend on what Avogadro's number is. So the 
expression to use for part A would be, okay, amount of heat that's needed. All right, so the heat that's needed is the specific capacity for diatomic gas that should be five and a half KB times the number of molecules that would be this times the change of temperature. So 10 degrees to, to 33 degrees C. So I, let me just write it out as, uh, or change of temperature, 33 degrees C minus 10 degrees C. And oh, oh I should have checked this first, that it's a constant value. I think I won't really get to a constant pressure process on, so until this week, because that deals with the uh, first law of thermodynamics. So all the questions from problem set two should be constant volume processes. So, so that's uh, the e expression you should be using. And since uh, there were more uh, unusual number of people asking, let me just plug in the numbers to make sure I did this correctly. I just, uh, well, technically what I want to be sure is, I want to make sure that I didn't make any um, programming error in the question. Uh, five halves times number of molecules, eight times 10 to the power of 23 times uh, 23 times, now let me plug in Boltzmann's constant, um, 1.38 times 10 to the power of minus 23, okay, equals 635 joules. Uh, let me write that down here. Heat of uh, 635 joule must be added. And let me just plug in to double check that it gets graded as correct and there's nothing I need to fix. 635. Good. So that's how you should do it. So hopefully people who are um, struggling with this um, just uh, needed that thing about the degree of freedom. And I think that's, uh, be, yeah, read carefully for the difference between specific heat of diatomic gas and monatomic gas. And the origin of that difference is that degree of freedom. Um, so uh, for part to be, it'll be the basically the same calculation as what we did here, except that, you know, noble gases, they are all monatomic. They don't form molecules. So, you know, xenon, it's just going to be single atom, single atom particle. So the degree of freedom for the monatomic gas will be three. So instead of five halves, you'll have three halves. And, uh, oh, I can actually calculate the number here based on this. So I can divide it by five, multiply it by three. That should give me the right answer. So let me try that. Um, divide by five, multiply by three. So 381 um, joules. So yeah, um, these gases still can be considered in ideal in some sense, as in, Nitrogen and oxygen are very different gases, but even so, uh, for part A, if you have a gas of mostly nitrogen or even mostly oxygen, the answer here will be the same. That's the kind of amazing thing about ideal gas law, which is that a single law, it uh, describes so many different types of gases. And um, with this kind of complication with degree of freedom, um, all you really have to know is what kind of geometric shape do the gas molecules have.